has a word future, and I have that up. Okay, hey, we're here to talk about the future of robot combat, everyone. Yeah. Uh, first off, we'll just sort of introduce ourselves. I'm Peter Abramson. I've got a few years of making movies and building some robots and making some mechanical crap. Uh, movie business sort of started with the movie Beethoven, built the puppet dog, A-Wing 3, the bishop head, uh, dinosaurs, built Robbie. Uh, Minute Black 2, built the short guy, Flapjack. Hellboy, uh, built a lot of mechanisms in the corpse's neck and body. Uh, a lot of mechanisms on that hand, but everything opened and moved and closed and spun and lots of things. And then uh, Hellboy Jr. that they went CG, but we built a full puppet of. Uh, touch table, long before these things ever existed, the patent for pitch, pinch, and zoom belongs to the company I work for, and we've made this giant mapping table. Uh, built some industrial robotics for first responders and some bomb disposal robots. Then got into robot combat in 1994 at uh, Robot Wars U USA, the first one, with my teammate Mark Satrakian. BattleBots, of course, came about after that. My robot Ronin never really did very well, but I had some toys made, so I did okay. Uh, Zozbots got into some one pound stuff, was a co owner and uh, event organizer with Zozbots. And finally, I am a producer on season one and two of the latest Battlebots. Please watch it on Sideshow. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I started uh, uh, doing Robot Wars around 1996, building robots when I was 10 years old. Um, and as you can see, the spinning blade robot uh, Doughboy was my first robot. Um, and then, oh sorry, I'll use this slide here. Um, and then next I did Tentamushi, 60 pounder um, ladybug robot that lifted up and then went down, captured the opponent and ground them up. Um, they made a Happy Meals toy with that one, um, one of my proudest moments. Um, um, next I, I continued building robots um, and started a company um, that Dinosaur and the other toys are connected Bluetooth toys. Um, and then on the right started doing um, electronics and rapid prototyping for wearable type situations, um, which led to this, my latest job. At Sproutling, making a wearable that um, basically it goes on your baby and predicts when they're going to wake up, when and it tells you when the baby's sleeping, when they're awake, if they're on their back, on their stomach. Um, and then most recently, season one and season two of ABC Battlebots. Well, just let me know when you're ready. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm Charles Wan. Uh, I, you might recognize me from uh, BattleBots Season 1 and 2. Uh, also, otherwise, if you're on the internet, you might have seen some of my electric vehicle and other combat robot builds. Uh, or if you've been at DragonCon, since 2002, I've been at DragonCon, competing in various ways. So I've been like a small-timer competitor ever since I watched the original BattleBots. Uh, next please. So, for some reason, all of my robot shenanigans got me into my teeth. But either way, uh, while I was there, you can see some of the things I was involved in. A lot of that was published. I have a penchant for uh, kind of getting other people to do things, so I enjoy uh, maker type content and generating content. So on the left, some uh, the thing that I will never ever live down is a man shopping cart I turned into a go kart. A lot of professors at MIT still know me only for that thing. Uh, over on the right, I was part of a student club where we attempted to hack and invented. Uh, Violated shop safety rules, as you can see on the upper right. Um, and on the bottom, it's kind of like the group of us. So later on, that led in life to becoming an instructor. Uh, I was in grad school at MIT, and then I was a machine shop instructor. Uh, I helped set up the lab that I ended up running. And through that, I actually started teaching a lot. So I ran a design course that was called uh, 2 Double Go Kart. The, the event was um, kind of parallel, the 2 Double Seven mechanical engineering design course at MIT, except with go-karts instead of silly little robots. So it was really popular for a while, then I moved on to just 
doing my own stuff. Uh, I left my instructorship job a few years ago, and I've, I have my own product line now. Um, if you go on equalzerodesigns.com, a lot of that was birthed in the sport of combat robotics. I kind of served the community and tangentially the electric vehicle and automation power communities. And I have also done all that. No. No way. It isn't so. Believe it or not. Yeah, so over on the left, overhaul number one, uh, built with a large crew, including some of the guys over there. Hi! Uh, not that large. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, over on the right, overhaul number two, uh, when the boy band split up after season <laughs> one. Uh, <laughs> built our own separate designs, and I carried that design. So that is me. I'm less cool than them. Don't listen to them, not me. So the reason why you're here is for us to talk about robot content, right? So here's where we grew up. This is sort of the pinnacle of what we're about. And here comes another revolution to own the attack. So that sort of led us into, we have this problem right now, is we have a certain level of robots that are kind of rock, paper, and scissors. So we have the flipper, we have the wedge, and we have the spinner. And each one beats itself, it beats the next one fairly well. Uh, how do we get out of this? How did we evolve and get into this space? So we kind of were driven by the environment the robots are in. The arenas kind of simplified and became a, a certain shape. Basically, the flat floor. <coughs> the flat floor has kind of led us into a very focused set of designs that have started to happen, which is you have the wedge, you have the spinner, and you have the flipper. Now, what can we do to change that design, Charles? Yeah, so not only that here, the uh, thing I want to add is, so if we've seen like first robotics competitions, like Vex and other kind of school leagues, if you notice, almost all the robots are standardized and look alike. Robot combat has the opposite problem, actually, believe it or not. It's, our rules are actually so open-ended that people are, in fact, allowed to kind of explore whichever design wins. <laughs> and so we are, in fact, the most pure implementation of robotic Darwinism right now. And it has exactly led us to these kind of apex predator scenarios. So that's actually a major difference between us and a lot of other robotic sports. So what, what can we do? What is, what's the next step to change? Because right now, we're kind of hitting this spot where you have robots like Tombstone that are perfect at what they do. Bronco, which is perfect at what it does, at flipping at the robots. But where's the water? Where's, where's the really dynamic robots? Like back in, I remember when we first were doing robot wars back in 95, 94, like Test Toaster 1 was a bucket Five gallon bucket with a two by four on it, and it had two little go kart wheels for drive and a caster at the back of it. And it just sort of rolled out into the middle of the arena. It had no real weapon, it had no real anything. It was Spiny Norman, which was an RC 10 with a shoebox covered in nails. Right? And, and, and aluminum foil. And aluminum foil, yeah. yeah, that was good on it. Yeah. I miss robots like that. That's, like, that's the problem, is we can't have robots like that. Because, what are you going to do? You're going to stick that in with, with Tombstone? Go. You battle bots give me enough money to build it, I will do it. <laughs> <laughs> so something that we could do is we could possibly change the floor, change the environment. Any evolution usually is about a niche that's been evolved into, and if you change that environment, the life within that niche will have to change and adapt to, to, to that new environment. So could we add obstacles into the floor? Can we go outside, do it in the dirt? Could we make like a half pipe type shape thing so that robots 
it's not so flat. You can climb up the walls. So there's a, the ability that very low robots, such as like a biohazard, cannot climb that wall. You can have to probably add suspension if you were to add terrain. Uh, sometimes robots that have done a pretty good job of kind of adapting to what's, what's been going on is the, the Swiss Army knife robots. The original <laughs> being the master, which could bolt on different weapons based upon who they're fighting. Bombshell, who did a brilliant job this year, or last year, of, of showing that. Lisa, who, without realizing she was needing to do that, did that at the fight. Yeah, so this is, find it out? This is a great example, as you can see in the bottom pictures. Um, you can sort of see in that middle one that the weapon is separate. So it's this um, steel system that attaches onto the back of the, uh, of the aluminum chassis. And after my first match, um, spoiler alert, sorry, uh, I hope everyone's watched season two, but I, I realized that the judges couldn't see what was going on underneath the shell. They couldn't see what the weapon was doing. They couldn't um, see anything. And so I, after that first match, I was sort of sitting in the bleachers, having this silent moment of you know, thinking what I could do if I was to get a wild card. And um, I thought, why don't I just switch this around? There's nothing stopping me. So I went into the pits and I found out if I just drill this one extra hole, I can take the weapon and switch it around so it's shooting off the back. So I can have the spinner on the back and the capture on the front. And the next fight was amazing and it totally worked. Um, it switched around the weight distribution as well, so my traction was really good and I totally beat Stinger Fast. <laughs> One downside of modular robots is they're really hard to execute because if your module connections aren't perfect, then your robot is not much more friendly. Well, that's true because you yeah. spend energy and material in the modular, in making the structure to hold these different shapes, right? Like Bombshell had to make certain elements in the structural that you plot the weapon in. It isn't like you have the ability to use the chassis of the existing robot to sort of hold that weapon. You had to actually build yeah. much better things. And that, that it does. Weeks lead back to the, um, like the current arena of materials debate is that the robots have gotten so incredibly powerful uh, and so damaging that the best shape for a robot right now is a small and compact brick, right? You see that if you go to any of the events, most of the robots, even tomorrow, if you go, go to micro battles tomorrow morning, you'll see that bots that have spinning weapons are all small and compact with a little weapon on it. The robots that are counter to that are generally small and compact with armor. And it's because everything that sticks out is going to get ripped off. It's like, why would I build anything with like a big, forky, grabby thing when if I run into the wrong thing on Tombstone and it will instantly just like disappear? You know, it's not worth our time to do that, given the current environment. Right. I mean, Minotaur is another good example of that. It's nose to back. It's about that long. It's probably about that wide. And it's only about that thick. It is a solid 250 pound brick. Of course, with this seriously <laughs> brick. Speaking of those uh, shapes, uh, shapes that like Charles was wanting to talk about is walkers. That's why we don't see much walkers anymore. Exactly the reason why we don't see walkers. Well, you cut their legs off. Bingo. Um, some of my favorites, the snake. I don't know if you really call it a walker. I mean, I guess it is. It isn't using wheels, so, but uh, uh, Donald's gear crawl, praying mantis that Almost made it into season two, but they just couldn't get it up and running there in the pits, uh, so it was a sadness. Um, and of course, one of my favorite robots of all time. Oh, Just technically weren't there yet. Mm -hmm. um, 
people were trying to chase LED, IR LEDs, and it just really wasn't working yet. So that but that was like 94, 96. Yeah, exactly. We didn't have any of this technology. And I think what Zoe did with Chomp, with using a LED R on the front, and they actually did a lot of programming. There's something that most people don't realize, and you can see. Sees it in the video is the fact that the robot has a certain amount of hunting that will actually turn itself to focus and fire the hammer without the person having fired. It was moving on its own. That first sight took out the chain of weapons. So, Lightning is already basically a wedge in the You want to like just slow down the video so people can see that? I don't know if you can do that. I don't know if you can do that. I don't know if you can do that. I do that. that. Yasha could flick the dead man switch on his radio and it would go into this mode that as the other robots came, it would just track. So it was seeing other robots and then when they got to a certain distance, it would fire. Which, I don't know if any, how many people have operated hammers in this room on a robot and trying to fire them at the right time and when another robot is in front. It's like you're always watching Battle Balls or any of the other robot things and going, come on, why didn't you fire your, ro your hammer time? We are not fast enough. For anyone wondering, it is really difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Machine gun hammer and hope. Something else, uh, maybe change more of the shapes like we were talking about with walkers. Uh, it more anthropomorphic, give it more humanoid shape. So here we of course have the, the Overlord versus that beautiful T-Rex head that Warhead had brought just for this. Also, uh, one more thing, Mark's tracking. Oops, sorry. Mark's tracking. Oh, now, you know, the Japanese have been doing uh, the Robo One style stuff, but these are of course a lot bigger. They have the big T-bars behind because trying to, you know, when the so to make this dynamic with the election make it work, mark out of the big T-bar. Come on, Megabots, we're counting on you. Even at a bigger scale, so it, I think it'll work a lot better on that. The problem with humanoid and you know, tall walkers like this is always balance. Even today, balancing is not perfect. And if you ever see like Boston Dynamics test videos, there are walkers all over all the time. But somebody that's definitely doing it on the big scale. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Radio check. This is Eagle Prime. Command, are you reading? Affirmative, Eagle Prime. Command is reading. We just uploaded the latest Mercury class firmware, so it's going to feel a little more frisky today. Don't get too cocky. You're clear to power on. Those switches do not. I actually just came from the uh, gaming room after playing a VR Mech Warfare game. 
sorry, E, we got a long way to go. LAB, Hexatesla Megabot, hire me. <laughs> you probably could have got a job about a year ago. I'm yeah, sure. I know. Want to. Okay, and now it's time to unleash the charts. Sportsman it's class. Not that bad, Peter. <laughs> All right, so as much as we've been talking about uh, like open combat flat floor arenas being this, you know, kind of totally Darwinistic, super optimized environment. Uh, a couple of years ago, there were a group of builders that decided that did have, you know, they, they're done with that. So the sportsman's class was formed in uh, primarily the Northeast leagues. Uh, this, the principles of it have kind of leaked all over the nation and worldwide, which is great. Uh, and the whole idea is that you don't go as hard. Uh, there's some rules that ban specifically high energy kinetic weapons and, you know, wedges with no weapons. Uh, so it's a more, you, you kind of, you take the whole spectrum of robots, you cut off the ends. Like, what are the apex predators? You have the, the box that just kind of runs into things, and then the, the little thing with a gigantic blade bigger than itself on it that just runs into something and explodes. So, essentially what they've done is they've kind of, you've cut off those ends, you say, you know, we're going to optimize more for creative designs, some of these old school designs that you don't see anymore, like robots are modified, like locomotive feet and stuff. Um, and really, like, the... The quote up there is actually from my website. I don't know why. I thought it was, oh, what a great quote. Someone really smart wrote this. And I realized you ripped this from my website. I started feeling really bad <laughs> So you can see you know, a lot of the sportsman bots, the two examples that were on the last page. That was a flywheel type flipper where it has a giant, it spins up a giant wheel, but instead of hitting you with it, it hits itself, but it pops an arm up that sends the uh, opponent flying. So that kind of design. You spend more than half of your weight just in that mechanism, right? So what do you have left for armor? You don't have that much. So you're not going to really survive in that type of uh, open box environment. But you can see like on that upper photo, that was built by a team of high school students at the most recent event that I was at. And it's really spindly. It's not going to survive in a full contact situation. But the accessibility of the sportsman class is so much greater is because you don't have to build to survive the most dangerous weapon. Uh, I, I'm not sure if that, I forgot if that bot did well or not, but the flipper did work. The kids did get it up and run that one. Uh, no, the one on the follow-up. Okay. Yeah. And the class also tries to encourage things like the thing on the bottom. It's, I'm not sure what it's made from, but it's basically two bike chains with like spikes welded to them. And it did nothing except crawl over you. <laughs> and you know what? That's all, that's, that's okay. It's okay. It was entertaining. The crowd loved it because it's exactly what they think a battle bot looks like. It's big and spiky and it's just like, you know, Running, all, running you over and stuff, and that was fine. And oftentimes these bots can operate five, six, seven years straight, just because you take damage, yeah, but it's not like you leave the arena with like a wad of metal, right? It's damage that you can repair, you pull a wheel, you pull a this or that. So I think Robot Battles, actually, if we go to the next slide, Robot Battles, yeah. the event that we've been running here since, uh, well, Kelly's been running here since like, literally the year after I was born, which is terrifying, oh. um, is basically the spirit of the sportsman class uh, kind of condensed down a little more because we don't have an arena. Uh, the robots, as you will see, if you haven't been to the Robot Battles event, they fight on the stage, kind of like you know, a big one of these tables. So the danger element is not only uh, the lack of containment for high-speed weapons, so those are pretty much completely banned, but also that if you don't drive your robot carefully, if your performance is not that hard, you're just going to go straight off that way. No matter how good of a robot you build, you can still fall victim to the 10-year-old who has played a lot of video games with faster reflexes. <laughs> I used to be that kid! Not anymore! <laughs> yeah, so... And you wonder why I became a producer instead of driving robots. Are you hiring, Peter? I am not. I quit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Basically, there's a lot of these avenues uh, that even in the sport of robot fighting that we know itself, we've been trying to kind of push ahead. In fact, the sportsman class itself has seen a very recent rule reform that basically came about as we realized in the open class, really spinners are the problem. And some people accuse me of robotic racism when I say this, but spinners are the problem because they're the ones that will completely trash your bot, with leaving you with not much left to kind of rebuild. And that has actually pushed a lot of folks out of the sport in the past like decade or so. And so, Sportsman's now allows wedges. Yeah, yeah. spinners cost this. Many yeah, much spinners cost this to build and they cost this to prevent. So, essentially now, the 
kind of the spirit of robot battles has made it back into the sports with rule set. And so we have our wedges and the lifters that are just like big flat dustpan kind of plates, they were banned, now they're allowed. In the first year or so of sportsmen's events with this new rule set is about to begin. So I'm kind of excited to see where that front goes. So I, I personally like it, uh, just because I got, I got sick of the open box game. I used to have a 12 pounder that I built for open box events, and it just got wrecked like twice. And I realized, unless I make it even tinier, make it all out of aluminum, and ditch the lifting arm, and do all this, it's like, what's the point of that? That's not fun to me. Yeah, even one a little brick. I would rather have Uber Clocker on stage with robot battles, just like, you know, slamming people on the ground over and over. It's funny to look at. I, I have the time, I don't care if I win. But plus, uh, for this slide especially, I think we want to make it more accessible too. Yeah. And so having these things that are one pound, two pounds, uh, with a 12 and 30, it's just like, like I brought one on my on my check baggage, you know? And so these 250 pound robots uh, are really hard for anyone to make or bring around and work on and expensive. If there's actually a little movement down in Orlando and the you know, southeast to make 250 or 220 pound sportsmen, so it's basically just a old school league is what it is. You, know, you use, you, you go back to using wheelchair motors, you go back to using lead acid, and everyone just does it voluntarily. They seem to have a blast. So, where do we go from here? What do we need to do? What do we need to change? Uh, is it all about the floor? Is it, is it? the event organizers having to spend all the money to completely rebuild a new arena, which basically why we're flattering this. Uh, you can imagine a curved floor, how expensive that would be, and how hard it would be to replace. Um, rule set changes, like sportsman's class. You know, do we start driving, or actually, do you start driving that direction of getting more event organizers to have <coughs> sportsman events? If you build a spinner for your first spot, I will judge you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you guys want to find us? Here's where to find us. My photo went away. It was on, like, it was on this like appear disappear transition. Right. Mr. Magic, it went away. Transition. Well, it's just in the garage. Anyway. That's right. Yeah, I think um, so. We're done with like the lecture part of this. Uh, we really are interested in hearing what you guys have to say and what you guys have to think about the future of combat robotics in any capacity. Um, it's like a lot of this was limited in scope to battle bots as we know it, robot battles, but we would like to fill the remainder of the time with audience engagement. You guys reach out to like NFLL uh, and talk to our kids, and try and get them to build better bots and engage themselves. Um, so I guess you guys, it's kind of hard because we're not really all in the same organization, but I believe all of us have done outreach, um, whether to secondary schools or to primary schools. Yeah. Would you guys be open to like if I, for instance, I coach a, a robotics team uh, for my daughter's elementary, would you guys be open to somebody call Jeff, whether it's a video conference or coming out to the particular location if it's close to you. Do you guys be open to that? Where are you? What are your kids doing tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> they should be here. Where are they here? I mean, yeah. Are and are why don't they have a robot in their hand? That's a, that's a certain thing. I will say if you contact us, we'll definitely be happy to help. If anything, we'll be happy to direct you to people very close to the area, which might be good. Nice, thank you. I saw a question over here. Yeah. I have no interest in building a robot. I am recovering. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of experience in organizing events. Are there resources for people who want to start running things? Like, is, is the finite supply getting enough events or getting enough people to participate? <coughs> That's a good point. It's very, it's very dependent on the area. There are some areas which are very saturated. Like in the, up in the Northeast, because there's so many of us, and the density is higher, um, we have events that oversubscribe for 24 hours. And we were running into that problem for an event in October that's held at the Ben Franklin Museum. Um, the there's, Franklin Institute? Yeah, th yeah. There's a lot of folks, that, even first time builders, that couldn't get a spot. So I, we feel really bad about that. You know, and then the more, like out in the Midwest and um, Colorado, there's scenes that are small, but there's a lot of people being like, guys, when are we going to have an event out in Illinois or something? Yeah, so it's, it, it really depends on the area. Uh, down here in the Southeast, I think people are taken care of. 
But I also haven't been down here in a little while, so I don't know the exact day to day. So as someone two miles from the Franklin Institute, how do you get into organizing? I can hook you up with the people who run the Northeastern Police. That's um, pretty much, you act, are you actually that close to the Franklin Institute? Yeah. Wow, what are you doing down here? Um, what am I doing down here? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, uh, you have our uh, social media contacts there. Shoot a message and we'll see if you have Who was over here? You were over here. Okay. Uh, one question which I <coughs> had partially. Um, you were talking about outside bikes. Uh, and I was thinking, could you maybe do something like that where you don't have a live audience, it's all done by camera, so that you can open up the type of weapons people could use? You can definitely do that. Um, that's one of the things that I've been thinking about. Um, my dad's actually taking on something sort of like that. Uh, back in the old days of Robot Wars, 94, 96, there was like a 2 camera by bot. 4 Yeah, there was a camera bot. But there was also there was like no arena, and that was very unsafe. And um, Robot Wars in the UK, they sort of fenced off the audience, actually. So it's not the, the audience, it's not the arena that has Lex and around it, it's the audience. Um, You're not trapped here with me, I'm trapped here with you. <laughs> you know, one weird idea which I just have is have an arena which is really kind of like a jungle gym, and the idea is if you can make the other bot hit the ground, it loses. Yeah, I think you're talking about a completely different paradigm of bots now. You know, it's, if it's revolutionary, so long as you draw on the builders, it will happen. Yes. Like it's, it's all dependent on organizing and getting the... Okay, the sorry, I'll in a second. Oh, no, no worries. Actually, Peter, was it? Let's make a street fight without an arena, which is all the builders just stood really far away. Yes, it was. And I think I got held to do it. Gravel from some horrible spinner. Always <laughs> 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 near bowling level. I think it was like 98 or 99. Yeah, guys had LBH. Phoenix, like, Phoenix, like, Phoenix Blaze had a little event out there in the dirt. God, it was pretty rough. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to say this hasn't happened where we've just had without arenas, uh, but we're still there. I so we've done some don't recommend it. Yeah. At all. Well, I was kind of thinking more in terms of like a pit or some sort of depression. So it would be really hard. So like you kind of look down on everything and just kind of stick your head out? Stuff flies up at the world speed. Well, that's kind of why I was thinking like web cameras or drones right. yeah. actually doing it. And you have to control it through that so that you don't have any humans actually where they can get hit by stuff. And then you can open up what people can do. It's like entirely possible. Yeah, explosives. All right, opening questions from stage right over here. Yeah, I was thinking that I when you were talking about the, the expense and some of the, the destructive nature of some of it, have you tried something along the lines of King of the Hill? I would love to so much. You just park a spitter in the middle. And, well, <laughs> so, yeah, but you have to get up there first. Yeah. The As boy, someone yeah, who has worked up closely with well, 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 organizers, there's definitely a set oh, yeah. of organizational and cultural inertia that also goes into, like, the whole reason we're talking about it is because all the events have been the same for change, you know? And it's basically it's whoever ponies up the money and the time to do it. So all these events that you see, besides like the big show TV show productions like Robot Wars and Battle Bots, are builder and volunteer run. So we're already running skeleton crews putting together a 24-foot arena, which is several hundred combined man hours of work. So if someone will show up with the gear to do all these types of things, I think they'll be very open to it. And it's like me, I have admittedly been on talk because I have not had time to weld up the giant steel hill for the events that I go to. But maybe one day I will, you know. So it's one of those, you guys literally make it happen. Like we can only ignite the spark. Yeah, it, it really is build it and they will come because I think most people want to fight and compete. And so they're going to build a robot no matter what if, if you're having some sort of event. So we don't want to usually like spend our time on an arena that's not going to get all that fun three minute action. Yeah. All right, you and then we'll come back over here. I think something in the realm of like evolution of it would, would help like it, it, trying to get more people into it. I think uh, an interesting difference I've noticed between this and other sports like it is non-permanence. There are events, but there's nowhere you can just, uh, that I know of, that you would just go and like, there might be someone else there you could have a battle with. Like, if, if you're into wrestling, you can go to a gym. If you're into boxing, you can train with other people. Pokemon. Well, yeah. <laughs> sure, Pokemon gym. But, like, there's, it, it, I, I think, like, if it could be possible that people could build, like, robot fighting gyms, basically. Like, something, like, you could have an arena that's, like, caged in and stuff, 
and it would be a place where people could test their ideas. Their yeah, ideas. Robot. You would not yeah. believe how badly I want this. <laughs> it's, uh, I've wanted it for years. Because the more people sure could test they... out more ideas with more other people well, testing yeah, their ideas. Yeah. It's all a matter of density. If when combat revives becomes a sport where you know maybe thirty percent of the people in this room have been involved in some way, that would be really easy. So I bet thirty percent of the people in this room have like lifted a weight or ran or somewhere. You know, it's, it's things that are things that are easier to get into and have a wider reach of community. We're still very niche. You know, like one of the last things on the slide was because we're so niche, any amount of money that gets put into a sport has a large effect. So I think I would love for that to happen. I, I really hope it does. I mean, think about going back to the birth of skateboards and yeah. Dogtown and, you know, that everything was in swimming pools. That they were finding it abandoned, you know, behind somebody's yeah. house and skating it. And it took a while. I mean, there were no skate parks. Yeah. But, like, the city I live in has a skate park that you can just go to now. I mean, so... Wouldn't be cool if we had the robot cool We'd get robot arenas yeah. in the same level, you know. But it's going to take a lot more growth. It's going to take more rope, more people building and more events happening. You, sir. Why do you look at the crazy? Is it possible to make it by water and not just by land? Battle boats. Battle boats. <laughs> <laughs> I think Let's you're do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay with this. Actually, have you seen mop scale model battleship? Fighting. Oh, yes. It's awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> so <laughs> this does exist to a point. There are people that build beautiful models of battleships, and they have little, very, very small BB guns that actually fire at other battleships because they're all built out of balsa, so that if you puncture the sides, they will sink. It's awesome. Yes. It is amazing. Yeah. Do you think we're a niche sport? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about getting specialized. Yeah, they fight like two of Yeah, so you can wait out and get your bits. Like. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so I know you mentioned like first and similar competitions. Have you guys ever considered what the effect would be if you did something like uh, putting a cost limit on bots that competed? Since you're talking about like the big ones are really expensive, and uh, to try to, I guess, get rid of the. Uh, people who can't afford to build like a really expensive bot, even if it doesn't weigh a lot, um, like keeping a bill of materials like first does. I found it garbage. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't 24 hours of lemons, I'm sorry. It's a, well, it reminds me of uh, the presentation last night about the, the power racing. Power racing series. I found it in the garbage for free. The hardest part, like the, yeah, the cheeky answer is we found it in the garbage. The real answer is the hardest part is enforcement. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like how, well, what do you factor in as like sweat equity, right? If you built an entire billet machine a loop in a bot, but you machine it by hand instead of a computer control machine, well, is that the same counted as the computer control machine, et cetera? So there have been precedents with uh, engineering, like kind of cobbled together racer type of events. Uh, 24 Hours of Lemons, the Power Wheels Racing Series that we had a presentation here last night. Uh, they have kind of rudimentary bomb rules where it's like, as long as we kind of can visually see it's not BS, we won't call you out on it. So, but the thing is, once you start injecting money into it, if like there's TV fame involved, you kind of have to codify it. And that's the hard balance point that no one's really tried to strike. Um, but I, also, I, I don't think any combat events have tried long limits. No, but, but if you look at the latest BattleBots, like, it sort of has been this, uh, like, Formula One type thing where but the robots keep getting more and more pricey and some people are using like all titanium. But the latest season, there were some robots that were very, very, very expensive. Um, uh, and they didn't do too well. So it's it's also about the concept. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's funny. <laughs> hey, I had to tell my mom I wasn't buying a house that year because of battle bots, all right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I really, I promise, I was thinking about a different robot. Uh, <laughs> so was I, we're thinking the same robot. <laughs> but yeah, it's driving, it's idea, you know, it's who you're fighting. So it's not always how much money. Thanks. Alright, there's a question there's for you guys. Multiple guys. questions yeah. over here. Let's take this round. Alright, I was just thinking, you know, rather than going with the curve floor, which is going to be a real track, I mean, let's face it, it's going to be really hard. What about just taking stacks of boxes and just putting them out? I mean, you don't have to have, I mean, if, if you have bots that are super low to the ground, they're just not going to be able to do that. 
Correct. You know, a quarter, a quarter, you know, a quarter to a half an inch of, of floor change is the, the wall for them as far as they're concerned. They're like, you're in this box, you're done. Right. So that would force them to have suspension. It would force them to have, you know, I mean, Alex. If you if you have a spinner and it hits it hits a, a concrete wall, yeah, it's it's gonna take damage. I mean, I mean, it wouldn't take a lot to do something like that as opposed to, I think, the complexity of I built this curved bowl, you know, and it cost me a hundred grand. And you say, hey, I just take these hollow metal blocks. And stack them. You know, like, the heck if they move, that's your problem. That's that's part of the deal. Yeah. So I invite you to come to Robot Battles on Monday, where the hotel purposely keeps its 10-year-old horrifyingly bad stage risers, <laughs> beat up edges and like high heel holes in the floor and stuff like that. We fight on that. Yeah, so it actually has to have some ground lines. Yeah, it's because <laughs> wise they just get stuck. <laughs> right. in the first place. This also happens at, at BattleBots, where uh, the floor, as you progress through through the competition, gets worse and worse and worse, and some things. Uh, there's big gouges, and so there's pieces of metal, like the is it quarter half inch steel. It ends up being the half inch of steel. It's multiple yeah. layers, but a half inch up. of steel peeled up, right? So everyone's been sort of building in, building in clearance. Every time okay. Chomp misses. <laughs> Every time Spintowski gets in the arena. <laughs> have there been any moves to restrict materials? Like, are there predominantly plastic robot fighting leaves, or we're not going to allow steel or titanium? Yeah. All printed robots. I'm yeah. totally down for all plastic. Um, but I, I, have, I have seen some smaller competitions where you have to, you have, to have all plastic. San Jose specifically, so I'm not sure if there's more. They are mutualized. I have a question. If we're logically bound to the same thing, if you guys enter it, what would be your strategy? Yes, oh my god, I miss robotic search. <laughs> if you were to enter, would you enter with the robots you have at home, or how would you do it? What would be your strategy? That's a good question. I would build for that <laughs> environment. Whatever, if, depending on what they were saying, here is what we're going to do. We're going to have a gauntlet that's going to be like this. I would build a robot that is designed to handle that. I would not try to take one of my own robots. Yeah, I know Ronan might do. Okay. I think Ronan with the tracks is actually going to do quite well in the environment of robotic. Overhaul is too low. It's designed for a flat floor. I yeah, I do. <coughs> I would love Robotica, I miss that show so much. It, de it added exactly the element of like, it's not just an open box, guess what, you have to climb over concrete blocks, kind of thing, you know? But I would not go the route of DARPA. <laughs> like, I love the robots, but walking on two legs is such a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> when your robot misses the doorknob. Yeah, exactly. Punches yeah. through the door. I'm amazed how much of that DARPA competition was pulled with the All right, uh, you down there. Yeah, this row will come back over here. So I was wondering if, uh, not along the same vein as Robotica, um, doing things more towards an objective base than a purely deathmatch style uh, robotics competition. Actually, have tasks. Yes, you can and, um, but it's not in the vein of just completing a task alongside somebody else. But obviously, keep the battle aspect there. But you know, something like a contested, you have to get there first, or you have to perform a task while the other person continues to try and finish theirs or interfere. If that would actually watch with the robots. Yeah, <laughs> I remember seeing exactly. early some early first stuff, and it was like a ping pong ball gallery that they had to do, and one robot drives out. For Big giant robot. Most of everybody had these like pickers that were there to grab balls, like yeah. independently. And it went out with this huge piece of metal that just plopped it down and made a fence, and then slowly grabbed all the things, not allowing the competitors to the rest of the ball. Yeah, I, I think first is pretty close. Um, I saw a competition this year, I think, and uh, it was. I still had the battle bots deep inside me, so I was watching it. And I was, yeah, I was like, oh, they tapped me. Oh, come on, come on, come on, fight, fight, fight. And then I realized, like, all these high school kids were like, no, that's not. We're not doing it. We don't do that. Uh, 
<laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, it was really great seeing that, uh, that they have these all these different things to do, and um, they really, you know, learn all the stuff that we've learned in the pits where you're given this much money, this much time, and you all have a different job, and I just, those, those pits are learning so much. I love those. Do fight the robots deep and just go out and just down and slash. Yeah, actually, uh, I was my last year first was the last year that did not mandate to fall bumpers. So that year, I just tricked my school into building a 120 pound middleweight battle bot, a three eighth inch thick aluminum frame and everything, and we drove it like a maniac. We, we cracked polycarbonate side panels in another rival school and rolled one person over, like one bot over. <laughs> We're just going to be bust that way. Not bad, bro. Yeah. Uh, I just had an idea. I want to know what you think. Uh, what if it's another variation on the fight? What if instead of you build your robot with your weapons, the weapons are distributed around your room, and you can go get one to try to get a robot? It's kind of on the uh, Swiss Army style thing, but like if you had some level of universal attachment. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, hard. Mike, could you uh, possibly come up with a docking mechanism for us? <laughs> Actually, the docking mechanism I think of isn't actually that difficult. It's like it's another one of those cases where you would have to basically build a new fleet of robots. So it's a matter of do you want to evolve along a path or do you want to fork off of it? And I think it's a, it's definitely a situation where if you do it, I will come. Forget about anyone else. I would love that. Like if all the robots have this like three three contact like kinematic coupling with magnets, or something that you just drive up to a weapon, you dock into it, and you start beating on someone with it, and then there's a little peg that pops it off, and you're done. I would love that. Yeah. my brother every time I watch the show. Is there a rule against injecting Yes. Wait, I, I apologize for the fact that the show never explains the rules. It is one of the biggest failings of ABC, is that they don't sort of like, here's what the rule set is and how this works within it. Um, it's probably because all the rules are against really like for that stuff, like foam like that. Foam, and explosives. Glue, uh, no, uh, no high voltage that you can come up and shock the other robot and basically fry all the electronics. Uh, no actually blockage of whether it's radio or a way of interfering with the other robots so that the competitor can't see it. You can post the rules online if you have a banner email. Or else, that's the bottom of it. These people have a chance. Yeah. I Oh, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. in the pits. That, so that has never changed from, from 1994. We had five teams pitching in and rebuild Mobius after half the bot got lost. Oh, yeah. it, it is, the community has always been about not me winning, but we're getting our two robots into the arena to fight. And whatever it takes to get that robot that's broken in, because the fight is what matters. Nobody wants to walk away with a forfeit. I was just wondering if that's different from like what I do versus what you do. I know it never changed. Except for, yeah. The first one I want to talk about, Yeti. Yeah. How many cards was Yeti running for the team? Oh, in the fight? Um, I know there was multiples out of Stinger. Yeah, um, Wheels from Bronco. Wheels from Bronco. Or spare weapon motors. Yeah. So, yeah, Yeti was put together. I mean, I give Greg so much credit. They showed up as an alternate on their own dime. Absolutely. And as somebody else failed, they came in. And, and they were. Kick ass. Yes. <laughs> it was awesome. I was so happy with Greg. Greg just blew my mind. The second, I think the consensus is we want. Junkyard Warriors against BattleBots. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh, 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 I completely agree. I stopped. Us for six weeks building our robots and fighting them. I stopped watching TV Junkyard. after Junkyard Wars and yeah. BattleBots went off the air. I have not watched TV since 2004. You do realize Junkyard Wars is a seated Junkyard. 
Yeah, we, we don't care. We don't care. Hey, hey, Peter Battlebot is seated. Don't give me that crap. We're building the Mazda cars in the parking lot. There we go. That's actually brilliant. We keep on the Mazda. 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 Here's a good mindset. I want to be put into the desert. We all get the same shit. We have to build robots and compete. Give me a Honda Accord. Give me $10,000 for the Super Mario. That's the shopping cart running through McMaster's watch. You've got 10 minutes. No, actually, McMaster's bigger than that. You're going to need like 40. I feel like McMaster's League would actually be too hard. Because you're going to have to like build a whole bunch of robots. Yeah, that's right. You're going to have to build a whole bunch of robots. Yeah, that's right. You're going to have to build a whole bunch of robots. Yeah, that's right. You're going to have to build a whole bunch of robots. Yeah, that's right. You're going to have to build a whole bunch of robots. Yeah, that's right. You're going to have to build a whole bunch of robots. Yeah, that's right. You're going to have to build a whole bunch of robots. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I absolutely love this concept. I really hope if I ever just get untold millions from a Powerball or something, I will make this TV show. I don't care if I lose untold millions on it, I will make this TV show. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So I'm wondering really if this whole tech design is uh, what we're incentivizing. Right now we're incentivizing to win and not necessarily to entertain. And is that kind of the fundamental problem here? And, and can we really have full? Like, as a builder, Maybe it would have been better for the show if BattleBots told us what to do, hell, even scripted the fights for maximum entertainment, and then we wouldn't care about winning, give her the prize money, allow us to build our weird, weirdest robots, and we don't have to make bricks and spinny bits. It's, Can we have competition in entertainment both? It, it is a very tough, like, where, do we end up being wrestling? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's kind of where you're at, right? Yeah, we'll um, and, but at the same time, even building the win, Let's let's talk about you. Huh? Yeah. Boom, boom, boom. Right? <laughs> I mean that was entertainment. That was good entertainment. That episode was yeah. great that entertainment. Was, that was also incentivized because of the open application process. Just to get in, you have to be weird. Yes. So we want we wanted robots that were going to be unique enough. We weren't gonna pick bricks. You know, we needed something that was gonna be dynamic and showy, as well as that, you know. When you go to try to bid to a toy manufacturer, that they see a bunch of things, they go, we want to make those. And that's an important thing, is how do you market the robot? Right, and that, that's moving away from the open Darwinian aspect. And, go, and just going for win, right? Yeah, yeah I think show aside, um, my, my thoughts, and probably your guys' thoughts, is that I want I want to personally have fun in the competition and make something crazy and awesome and then have entertainment for myself and it's not really like I don't I don't care about the TV show aspects you know I did this when I was 10 you know flying out from across the country to compete in 96 just with like 15 other like 30 year old men and I was like 10 and it was it was just because I wanted to destroy a robot right so like. That's where I wanted to evolve as more of this hobby sport that's just about like you having fun destroying stuff and learning about how to build and all that camaraderie. Yeah, we're, we're there. Like, at the same time, Charles and I only got to fulfill like our childhood dreams of being on Battle Boss because the show did so well. And spreading that, and we're only engineers today because the show did so well. So having this as a show is kind of good for the world too. But maybe um, now it goes and it's many competitions throughout the entire US. So that's separating it from these entertainment aspects. We need like, the American Ninja Warrior style, where like let's get the Atlanta group. We fight here, and then like those three winners go to. That would be know. great. Yeah. That damn arena is very expensive it to is. move and set up. And it's all about budget. So we do. You have a thirty-pound qualifier class. Ooh, cool. scale we it. Put that arena in trailers and drive around the country. Yeah, absolutely. Go, go get Bob Pitzer because I think he still has a trailer somewhere. Like as as soon as my uh, flying car startup gets a series, I am doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Adam, do it. Go ahead. Is the rocket going to take this phenomenon endemic across all sizes, assuming the flat arena, or are there scales over which it's just not feasible? It's extremely commonplace because there is, there's, I would say there's a few size brackets and parts. It's not just weight classes, but the same parts apply across weight classes. So you have this kind of constancy where a certain 30-pound design will do as well as a certain 250 pound design, will do as well as a one pound design. They're not going to use the same parts, but the same concepts. Why don't you mix in like an American Idol type setup where the audience can vote for the robot they like? <laughs> <laughs> the original how, how would you guys like to be voted on like that? I mean, the application process wasn't too far from that, but just the voting audience was tiny. It was a very small audience. <laughs> I'll put it on Twitter. 
Uh, Question back there. Then we're going to have Bodie make both robots. <laughs> 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 yeah, so if, if we use the Twitter technique for the latest ABC version, uh, we did this fighting all like one week long, and so it would, it would take like two months. Yeah. So one thing I've always been thinking about for a while is that the show, first of all, focuses on a single individual, and secondly, it's only one Mac long or two robots. One idea I've been entertaining is actually focusing on the competition longevity and the team aspect by having multiple rounds for two robots fighting. So we're going to go from single matches, win or lose, to a boxing format, where you go multiple rounds, if no KO, until you die by attrition. Is that something you would shake a fist at? <laughs> so this is, um, my take on that is it's sort of, it's sort of like football. I hate judges! <laughs> well, it's sort of like football where there's only so much that the robot or the person can take. Uh, so I would say that's totally doable if your robot doesn't get totally destroyed and you have to like spend a lot of money. So if it's good. Yeah, so I've got two things to say. One, as Xander has always said, never leave it to the judges. So that's on you to make sure your robot doesn't leave it to the judges. Well, then you have to build two. That's the problem that we're talking about. What is it? Sorry. What about team versus team? Paint all the robots on one side, like a certain color? That would. So we've had rumbles, but yeah, those are yeah. end up being one on, yeah. you know, they end up being about a single robot in the end. But yeah, teams would be great. Yeah, two v two tag right. team, three v three. I would love to explore those formats. There's some smaller events that, like ant weights, speedo weights, one pounders, three pounders, that have explored, uh, like a Swiss type tournaments or multi bot uh, rumble eliminations. So it's it's getting up there for sure. And and even going to like possibly World Cup style where you have groups, you know, and you sort of. Everybody has to at least fight each other in that group before you move on to a single elimination tree. Guy behind you. Yes. Uh, have you ever tried like a, a race thing? Like Mario Kart, for example, where you destroy each other and try to get the Let me tell you about the Power Racing series. <laughs> <laughs> we claim it's not BattleBots, it's basically driving with BattleBots. <laughs> no, this got banned. Oh, yeah. It's a so we need an official after show that's very technical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we could have one of those, shouldn't we? It is eight, yeah. Let's get technical. Technical. Who's got, like, motor questions? <laughs> John, anyone anyone designing their own custom motor controller? Yeah. What do you see as you run this year overall? Oh, Lord. <laughs> you, you actually want me to answer that question? I do. <laughs> yeah. I do. There, the ones that were overhauled in season two were, uh, large model airplane controllers that were modded with a custom um, open source firmware for racing drones. Yeah, so that actually, that experiment was very successful and spawned into one of my most recent product lines that is currently out for pre-order. Yeah, what's up? The end of what? So fundamentally, this item is uh, a DeWalt 18 volt drill motor and a drill gearbox. The housing was custom designed, and I had it sent out to manufacture by Machine Shop. And then uh, I put everyone together. <laughs> hey, the Chinese. Put everyone is it okay for us to keep going on, or do we have to get out of here? One caveat: I don't care if we talk later, but at some point in the evening, Tech Ops is going to come in to reset the room for tomorrow. So whenever that happens. Great. Last night is around 9 o'clock. Yeah. I think I'm going to stay happy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we'll happily take a few more questions up here. Um, that earlier mentioned uh, the skateboard and, uh, and starting out in old abandoned swimming pools and such. I don't know if the robot historians and experts have ever seen like an old pool converted into an arena. Maybe just a Lexan lid. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> we, we were just talking about this earlier. Has anybody ever tried that? Uh, not that I know of. Not that we know, but it'd be cool. There's, there's an old YMCA for sale in Chattanooga. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been eyeing it for a while. So, so, so you're saying you're doing it, Jason. Anybody have $4 million I can borrow? Yes, sir.
second slot for a commercial and Coke just got three minutes for free or how much they paid me which is not the same and so that was their big issue. I guess what I was saying is more along the line is you know, it's either an individual or you've got a team working on this. I mean, you could have YouTube channels of every aspect of the journey you know, from the beginning to totally. the last you know, Some of that things and, and you know, I don't know how much you would have to compete, you know, compete with the network as far as the name involved but you can put, you should be able to have yeah, there's, some level of sponsorship. There's definitely that. things like that were allowed, social media things were allowed, uh, but it comes down to time. Like, you almost have to have one person whose their job is social media, and they're handling all of that, and being the videographer, and taking care of yeah, editing, and, that. and putting that, because everybody else is building, right. and they're building way to the wee hours of the night. Well, yeah, this, is, this so. is full time job, two months of building, which is um, for me, it was like 8 p.m. to 2 in the morning and then all weekend. So, like, I don't have a social life. No. <laughs> <laughs> used to robots. Yeah, robots. Relationships. Um, but yeah, I do have a YouTube channel now. And so now I go and I make videos every once in a while that show how to build a robot. Um, but that's sort of, you know, post production is in my spare time. Like, the, 
the room that I was in, the TV room, the big tray room, like, full of monitors and a bunch of guys editing and making it all happen right at the same time with the directors going, camera A, camera C, camera A, you know. In there was Little Miss ABC person, right, from Legal. And when that happened, everybody looked at me and went, what happened? Is that okay? And I went, no, that's not the rule. And it just, <laughs> explosion. Like, books came out, people jargon, they were all running out. Oh my God, we had to go talk. And it was just a nightmare. That's why, because I mean, the amount of ass chewing that went on with Trey was when, when you guys showed up with the box saying, look, we're being funny. Trey was like, this isn't funny. This wasn't funny. That was the first batch, right? But that's the best part. That was, I think, one of the first batches, yeah. yeah. So we weren't going to actually leave the box on the robot when we put it in the arena. We were going to just give it to them as a gift. Right. Then someone from production asks us if we're willing to leave it on the robot for the fight. Yeah. And then the we have to tell the right. right. <laughs> We were really sad the box would catch on fire. Right. Yeah, it ended up in the water. Yeah. Oh. No. Also, no. Yeah. So, maybe it's a good time to ask. I thought complete control. Okay, there we go. They're my friends. So I'm um, biased. We love complete control. They They're said awesome. it was left out of the rules when they rewrote the rules. So. Remember, the rule said no blue or ball bearings or and such. I think wire and rope was in there too. Uh, it never, it, the old rules back in the day that everybody competed on, there used to say no entanglement, right? Which meant nets and fishing line. Like everybody understood that. Well, that wording did not exist in the new rules. No entanglement did not exist. And it was, you know, but it was the and such. So it kind of was in there, saying like, the spirit of the idea is don't do this. But Derek, being Derek, was like, you know what? First of all, they, so remember how I was in the room up there with all of the ABC people and you guys all got brought up in season one to have your interview and sort of talk to them? Derek's late hit from pressure drop from 100 years ago was, oh, you're the bad boy from back at Comedy Central days. <laughs> and so they wouldn't let go of this. Like, ABC were chewing on him about him being the bad boy. And so that, Derek just looked at them and went, you're going to do this to me? Fine. I'm going to own it. And so that's what he went. And so not only was he always saw, it. He saw a little spot in the rules where he could go for it. And he just said, if you guys are going to paint me this, I will be the best painting you ever see. <laughs> we, we spent like two hours behind stage waiting to go fight. Did nobody ask what was in the box? <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody knew that you weren't going to have a real thing, but... No, season one. No, no, season one. one. I mean, like, we got a match in season one, was that nobody asked what was in the box. No, I don't think any... Well, I, I think I remember saying something about it. He says, no, it's just a surprise for Chuck. Surprise for Chuck. It was supposed to be like, people thought, oh, he's just got confetti. <laughs> Because right. it's going to get hit by that blade and just blow up and have a bunch of stuff. That you know, it, could, it couldn't Blitter. have happened to a better opponent. It couldn't have happened to a better opponent. Chuck was <laughs> cozy. So, I mean, it was brilliant that it happened to Chuck. But, so it goes. All right, I think I'm going to have to stop. Okay. Um, yep. Good talking to you I guys. think we're good. Thank you. Yeah.